But a little less than 2,000 years after its construction, another bridge, 200 kilometers away, revolutionized the world of civil engineering. Like the Pont du Gard, it also set a record for the largest bridge ever built. It's one of the major works of Gustave Eiffel. Five years before the construction of the tower in Paris that bears his name, Eiffel creates an incredible viaduct for the time. More than 3,000 tons of iron, a deck 564 meters long, a height of 122 meters. In 1880, this is the site that everyone is talking about, and its fame will spread around the world among engineers. A spectacular site for the highest bridge ever built of the time. But it's also a risky site, and many people will harbor doubts until the last moment. Even the French state wonders for a long time if this viaduct were not madness. About 145 kilometers from Clermont-Ferrand, a river, the Tuyère, crosses France's central plateau. Wide and deep, the Tuyère gorges constituted a natural border. In the 19th century, they cut off those who lived in the south from export and prevented farmers from selling their products up north. It's the winemakers who finally punch the table. They want a direct way to bring their wines to Paris. Yet options are limited. The only feasible connection is by train, and this means the construction of a new railway line. A suspension bridge, however, is out of the question. The force of the wind rushing through the Tuyère gorges is too strong and would make the bridge swing dangerously. Circumventing the Tuyère is not a valid solution either. The costs will be astronomical. There's only one way, to cross the Tuyère directly. It's then that a young state engineer, Léon Boyer, decides to copy an already existing bridge and to take on the same geographical constraints. In the last quarter of the 19th century, Gustave Eiffel is a household name. He's just finished the sublime Maria Pia Bridge in Portugal, 352 meters long and 61 meters high. Eiffel has proved that he can achieve astounding feats whatever the conditions and build big while reducing costs as much as possible. The state and the railway companies demanded that the firms to whom the work would be assigned deposited a bond to ensure that they would go on to the end. Eiffel associates with Thierfel Serig, another brilliant engineer, and a man with the financial means to put down the required money. The two men decide that the viaduct will be 200 meters long and rise 120 meters above the level of the river. At the time, no bridge has ever reached such a height. Garabit would become the largest metal structure in the world so far. It seems a huge gamble, but it's the solution that's retained by the state, a state which will not exactly facilitate Eiffel's task. Access to the Tuyère gorges is non-existent since there isn't a single road. It was all the more crazy since logic would have called for building the railway line at least up to one end of the viaduct first, but that wasn't to be. Transporting materials to the gorge is a major headache right from the beginning. The bridge was to be in working condition before the railway line was built, so the railway people were cautious and a little sceptical. After unloading at the nearest train station, all metal parts of the viaduct must then be transported to Garabit by horse and oxen over 34 kilometers. This would greatly extend the duration of the construction, which lasted four years, while usually Eiffel did everything under two years. To compensate for the delay, Eiffel decides to build a veritable village at the foot of the viaduct. 400 workers and their families will have housing, a bakery, and even a school. In January 1880, Work on the abutments, as well as on the foundations for the five piers, begins. 
the good news is that no deep digging is needed to anchor them firmly in the rock. The masonry is done by a team from Italy. The work is considerable. It takes two years to raise the seven bases. At the same time, Eiffel is building an essential prerequisite for the construction of the viaduct, an ephemeral bridge. He used this service bridge to put the various parts in place. The heaviest of these were hoisted by winches. Thus, the transfer of materials between the riverbanks is simplified. And thanks to this bridge, the arch can be spanned over the void. Yet before that, all metal pylons are erected. With varying heights from 24 to 60 meters, their structure clearly shows one of the hallmarks of the engineer, also present on the Eiffel Tower. The diagonal, or St. Andrew's Cross. The crosses provide the structure with an internal balance and they prevent deformations which may be caused by gales. If a pylon is made up of solid panels, it provokes a strong resistance to wind bursts. The key to the construction of these girders is the use of rivets, which allow two parts to be assembled. It's done by driving a small rod through two metal plates. The rod is heated beforehand until it's glowing red. Once between the two plates, the other end is hit to give it a second head. When the rivet cools, it retracts and holds the metal parts as close together as possible. On this bridge, there are 678,768 rivets, exactly. Today, these rivets are one of the main concerns of maintenance. With time and the daily passage of trains causing strong vibrations, some may come loose and no longer keep the plates properly fixed to each other. So parts of the viaduct are regularly checked with this problem in mind. We use a small hammer to sound the rivet and according to the sound it produces, we can tell if it's deconsolidated or if the paint is just a bit cracked. With the 678,768 rivets of the viaduct, it is indeed a tedious operation. The rivets, of course, will also weld the upper part of the viaduct, the deck or apron. This is where the rails will be put. It's built as and when the piers are finished, literally pushed forward from both ends of the bridge. From the western end, the deck will advance to 103 meters. It's on the eastern side that the distance to be covered is longest, 282 meters. It will take 60 days to advance the western deck. Its opposite part will require 164 days of pushing. The workers lever and advance the deck 11 centimeters each time. For sliding, the structure is rested on pebbles at the top of the pylons. And so, to the sound of a bugle, everyone simultaneously raises and pushes the apron. However, the deck cannot be put into place just yet. At more than 100 meters above the void, between the two largest pylons, it needs a solid structure to rest upon. This will be the Great Arch, the largest ever built, with a record weight of 1,200 tons. In the 19th century, it's truly a tour de force. Cables fixed to the deck and to the pylons will retain the parts of the arch as it's built. So we have a structure that holds. We extend it, put parts on it, until there is a moment when there's no longer a balance to the added weight. So we support this new part by cables connected to the part that has already been mounted, and then we continue. The calculations were so accurate that the two parts met within half a centimeter from their ideal position. It was enough to drive in a bolt after one last massive push. 
Thus, on April 24, 1884, at 6 p.m. precisely, after four years of work, the two half arches are joined at a height of 122 meters. With their respective weight of 600 tons, they lock themselves above the void. Their combined masses, leaning against each other, ensure stability. There's no need for cables to support them. At the time, this arch with a base width of 165 meters is the largest in the world, twice the width of the Champs-Élysées. It's a stunning achievement. Now, finally, the deck can be put into place. Once the arch is well anchored, the viaduct is completed by advancing the rail deck from both ends. When joined, it has a length of 564 meters. This operation heralds the end of the work. It's time for the finishing touches, like putting on a new layer of paint. The red color is the same later used on the Eiffel Tower. It's due to lead, an additive for rust protection common at the time, but highly carcinogenic. Back then, all bridges were red because of the minimum. The use of minimum or lead-based paints today is forbidden. All parts from the Eiffel de Levallois Perret factories are pre-painted. But they applied a layer at the end of the work, and so it's red. With any metallic structure, the risk is rust. Yet Eiffel has bypassed the problem with the very structure of the viaduct. There are no confined areas conducive to the formation of rust. Since his viaduct is very airy, a strong wind will easily sweep the humidity away. The architectural novelty is praised the world over. There remains only one last test in order to ensure the viability of the viaduct. How will it behave under the repeated passage of hundreds of tons over its deck? The tests were done with a train that consisted of a 75-ton locomotive and 15 cars. The train was positioned above the arch and they measured a deformation of the structure of 8 millimeters, which is nothing on a structure like that. Although the effect is only a few millimeters, Eiffel wanted to obtain maximum flexibility in his bridge. So the engineer has essential pieces added at the base of the arch. They are ball joints that allow the structure to move. Each of them is anchored with two steel cylinders in the concrete bases of the viaduct. Thus, the arches can move a few millimeters by pivoting up or down. Each joint is like a kneecap. It allows for rotational movements to adapt to a possible bending of the structure. But it took some years until these tests could be conducted. Although the viaduct of Garabit was ready in 1884, no railroad had yet arrived. The politicians, despite the green light given to Gustave Eiffel, had always had doubts as to the feasibility of the project. Thus, four more years will pass before the first train will make its appearance on the viaduct. In 1888, Garabit finally sees the first trains pass over the Tuyer River. Meanwhile, Eiffel has dedicated himself to his tower in the heart of Paris, which is finished one year after the inauguration of the viaduct. Yet for many specialists, Garabit remains an achievement even more impressive than the Eiffel Tower. It stunned engineers and railroad companies the world over. It became a reference work. The construction of the bridge was a highlight of civil engineering at an international level and a boost for an entire economic sector. The viaduct of Garabit is presently under review for classification as a World Heritage Site, an honor already bestowed on the Pont du Gard. As for the viaduct of Millau, 
it will undoubtedly keep on fascinating the public for decades to come. Three Bridges, which, each in its own way, has proved that civil engineering can come close to up.